now you're live. Good morning, everyone. How's it going? Um, so for those who don't know me, my name is Dominic Perry, and I'm the host of the History of Egypt podcast. So essentially today, I'm going to be talking to you about hidden voices of ancient Egypt and some aspects of that. Um, I'm coming at this from two different perspectives. So when the, when uh, Roy Field and company introduced the theme to me, it occurred to me that for ancient Egypt specifically, there are a couple of ways that you can really treat the idea of hidden voices because ancient Egypt is such a big topic and such a big culture and uh, timeline and tradition that there are many aspects of it which tend to get hidden for a lot of people, especially in the public, but even for Egyptologists, as we're going to see. So before we begin, um, I think we sh I should thank, you know, Lyceum for hosting uh, the conference and also to Royfield and Ben and all of those who have been organizing everything and putting it together. Unfortunately, I'm currently based in New Zealand and it's 8.45 in the morning here, so I have missed most of the day, most of the day so far, unfortunately. Um, I was able to catch a little bit of some earlier uh, top topics a couple of hours ago, but I was still putting the finishing touches on my talk. So unfortunately, I've missed out on a lot of this, th this material. I haven't been able to participate with you live. So I'm looking forward to going back and watching some of the recordings to see all the things I've missed out on. But yeah, I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I am very confident that all of my colleagues and in these podcasting uh, speeches are giving wonderful presentations. And yeah, also uh, for those of you who aren't aware, immediately after this, I'll be jumping straight into the ancient history panel with another group of podcasters. And that's gonna be a really interesting discussion as well. So without further ado, let me start talking a little bit. So when we think about hidden voices in ancient Egypt, there are a couple of ways that I or we can, we can come at this topic. The first one is that I kind of want to make this a pharaoh-free zone. So anyone who listens to the History of Egypt podcast will know that as much as possible, I try to tell stories from the full range of ancient Egypt society and cultural traditions. I don't like to just tell the story of the pharaohs because Obviously, the story of a monarchy is not the same as the story of a country. A, the kings live in a very different world and very different socioeconomic situation from 99% of their subjects. And when we tell stories only about kings, we miss out on all of that wonderful information. So this talk will have no pharaohs, or at the very least, the bare minimum of pharaohs, just to give you a sense of where each particular little topic sits in the time timeline. The second aspect is that I'm just going to cover four short stories of people who are perhaps commonly unknown to the public. And I'm going to get into various reasons why these people are unknown. Some of them are unknown for obvious reasons in the sense that maybe the discovery is quite recent. Others should be better known or deserve to be better known and offer opportunities for us to discuss how certain stories get introduced into Egyptology. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about the podcast itself and what I've learned from doing this show and how I think it can mo uh, progress moving forward. <clears throat> so the first chap I want to tell you about is an individual named Merer. And Merer only came to light very recently in about 2013. <coughs> Pardon me. So Merer lived during the reign of Khufu. He lived around 2560 BCE. And Merer was a mid-ranking official in the Egyptian government. You might even call him a low-ranking official, actually. He was high, high enough in the society that he was literate. He could read and write. And we know this because in 2013, archaeologists working near the Red Sea discovered one of Merer's papyri, his papyrus. And as part of Merer's job, he was involved with quarrying limestone for the Great Pyramid of Khufu, you know, that slightly famous monument you can see in the bottom of your screen. Pardon me, dry voice. <clears throat> and as part of his job, Merer kept a daily diary 
of the activities of himself and his team as they were working on this project. And one of the reasons I wanted to open with this story is that Merer should be incredibly famous already in the sense that the discovery of his papyri was absolutely remarkable. For one thing, this is the, so far, the oldest papyrus ever discovered in Egypt, at least the oldest written papyrus. There might be fragments of um, the material from elsewhere, but this is the oldest one with writing. So that in itself is extremely significant. But what makes him significant for the general public is the fact that Merer is the first individual who has appeared in the Egyptian record with in, uh, undeniable evidence that he worked directly on the Great Pyramid Project. And this should be very significant for many people, especially in the sense that it really adds a whole nother layer to our understanding of how these pyramids were built and, you know, strengthens the argument, which perhaps shouldn't be an argument, as to why the ancient Egyptians did indeed build the pyramids. So Merer's job was what we call a sechej. And the sechej was roughly translated as sort of inspector. His, his responsibility was to count and record the quarrying of limestone blocks from a particular place in Egypt, a place called Tura. And at the, at the Tura limestone quarries, Merer and his team were responsible for extracting the blocks that went on the outside of Khufu's pyramid, the casing stones. Unfortunately, almost all of those casing stones are gone now. So what you can see in this little picture is kind of the core of the pyramid. Originally, there would have been a beautiful white layer of limestone on top of that, and Merer and his team would have extracted a large amount of that limestone. Now, surprisingly, Merer is not better known. In fact, even, even just a few days ago, I came across an article written very recently on the internet by a group who was sort of pro producing compendiums of various historical individuals, and when they discussed the Great Pyramid, this article, which seemed to be fairly well-researched, did not mention Merer at all or was not aware of him. Which is very strange because this individual, the discovery made headlines around the world when it was first, first came to light. And the publication has been incredibly significant for Egyptologists. So it sort of begs the question of, you know, why, why is such a significant find having trouble filtering out into the public awareness even for people who are interested in ancient Egypt. And this is one of the aspects of hidden stories that sort of occurred to me when I got the topic for this conference is, you know, up until 2013, Merer's, Merer's story was hidden for very obvious reasons because we didn't know about him. We didn't have the papyrus. But even now that we do know about him, he's still to some degree hidden from the public and it's not intentional. Egyptologists have tried to you know, make him widely known. But nonetheless, we, we do seem to be having trouble filtering things like this out into the wider consciousness. And as I was working on this paper, you know, I started to think about this question more and more in depth. You know, obviously, being, a, being an academic, it comes up occasionally is, you know, why do we have so much difficulty getting these stories out there and getting people to really know about them as much as we would like them to know? So that's one that's one small aspect of hidden voices I think that is that is worth considering or at least is questionable. But at the same time Merer is a good introduction to the other aspect that I want to talk about with this with this presentation which is the opportunities for moving forward. So one of the beautiful things about the Merer diaries and my absolute favorite is that when, when the first batch of them were published, there's going to be a couple of publications dealing with the full corpus. When the first batch was published, the, the English translations and the Arabic translations were provided online, open access to all. The, the actual book itself, you know, you still have to buy. But this one little section with the English translation and Arabic was released to everyone, which is quite unusual it's quite an quite a novel thing and it's ex absolutely fantastic and it's something i'm really glad that they did so the reason i like it is for two reasons one it suggests that egyptologists or academic publishers are finally starting to get out of this old mindset 
that in order to have the information, you have to buy the full publication, you, which, as many of you may be aware, academic publications are not cheap. They are, tend to be quite expensive, and people have trouble accessing them in many situations, whether they're uh, university students or just in the public. So the fact that they did this, the fact that they released this information free to the public, everyone could read the English translation and the Arabic translation is great. The second reason that I really like it is that they published a translation in Arabic. Because historically speaking, you know, Egyptologists tend to publish in English or French or German. And Arabic has been left out of the conversation for far too long, which is very strange and very frustrating. And it speaks to another element of this hidden voices uh, concept, which is that modern Egyptians historically tend to get left out of the conversation when it comes to ancient Egypt. For whatever reason, scholars or the public have this idea that because modern Egyptians speak Arabic and they practice Islam, they must have a fundamental disconnect from ancient Egypt or that they are not the same people as the ancient Egyptians which is absolutely not true. They are the descendants of the ancient Egyptians. And although their language has changed, so have the, lang the languages of many countries. And although they practice a different religion, well, how is that different from many other countries? You know, people in England would see themselves as the ancestors of Anglo-Saxons or uh, migrating people who came to that island, but there have been many changes. So why do, the, why do modern Egyptians get left out of this conversation? Well, hopefully that's changing. And I think this uh, Diary of Meria publication is a really good indicator of some of the things I'm looking forward to in the future and ways that we can, we can emphasize newer voices. The second little hidden voice I want to tell you about is a chap named Seneb. Now, Seneb lived basically around the same time as Meria, maybe 10 or 20 years later, very, very slightly. The reason Seneb is so fascinating is that he was a dwarf, a little person. And he's one of a very small number of little people whom we know about from ancient Egypt, but he is recorded very well. He has, he's very well attested in the artistic record, and we know quite a bit about him. So Merer lived around 2550 BCE. At the very least, we know that he was active in the royal court about 10 to 20 years after Merer. So Bas they're basically contemporaries, as far as we can tell. Now, the name Seneb means healthy, or it's possibly meant in a sense of uh, wishing, may he be healthy. And the reason I quite like names like this is that you can re when you get names like this, you can really imagine the mother giving birth to this child and giving him the name as a hope for his future. You know, she's holding this baby, and she can probably see the situation that's going on with his physicality, and she hopes that he will survive, that he will be healthy, and that he will grow strong and happy. And Seneb did. Seneb grew up in the Egyptian court, and he rose to an extremely high position. He became a priest for two kings, uh, Khufu and Jedethra. So Khufu built the Great Pyramid, and Jedethra was his successor. Seneb was a priest for both of these kings. He was also the overseer of the dwarfs in the royal court, which suggests that there were many little people living there for various reasons. And Merer owned a large amount of agricultural land and was quite a wealthy individual. Now, obviously, being wealthy and being a high-ranking individual was itself something that separated him from the rest of the world. But the fact of Seneb's physicality is extremely interesting. And one of my favorite things about him is this particular little statue, which I'm, I'm showing to you here. So first of all, the statue is rare in Egyptian art in that it doesn't try to be a sort of picture just of idealism or vision, that kind of thing. It moves, it moves straight into depicting him realistically as a dwarf. And one of the things that I really like about it is that because Seneb's legs are too short to fill out a standard statue, they have used his two children in place of his legs. So while his wife sits and she seems to be a, <clears throat> a normal statue, statue woman, Seneb st sits here with his two children uh, just below him. Nevertheless, Seneb gets to, tends to get left out of records of this period, 
and I'm not entirely sure why. My suspicion is that Egyptologists being sort of middle, middle and upper class academics have a problem with discussing things that they are uncomfortable with or unwilling to engage with in a larger political sense. And individuals like Maria who don't fit do tend to get left out for that reason. And apparently I'm talking too long because we need to move along. <laughs> so moving on from Seneb, but the third hidden voice that I wanted to consider is a, a queen. And her name is Ashait or Ashayet. Now, Ashait lived around 2000 BCE in what we call the 11th dynasty. And she was one of several wives of a king named Montuhotep II. The reason a shite is interesting is because of this coffin that is in the Cairo Museum. A shite's coffin her, and her burial, including her mummy, were discovered at a place called Deir al Bahari, which many people will know as the location for the famous temple of Hatshepsut. So there is also another temple near to Hatshepsut, which belongs to the 11th dynasty. And it seems that several royal wives were buried in this temple, including a shite. And a shite was discovered at this at this temple, along with her sarcophagus, a coffin, and her mummy, which is absolutely remarkable for the time. And yet, whenever discussions or narrative histories record this time period, they tend to ignore a shite. Even when there are discussions of queens specifically, publications about queens, a shite is only mentioned by name and we frequently do not see pictures of her. And <clears throat> I think it's not hard to see why this might be the case. To Egyptologists shame, let's be realistic, there is a degree of silence when it comes to the multi-ethnic or multi-cultural depiction of individuals from ancient Egypt. Now a shite is clearly a black woman, and this is an excellent thing, you know, it's a, a enriched part of enriched part of the ancient culture and things that we can discuss and yet egyptologists don't engage with her they tend to they tend to uh, do what we call that conspiracy of silence where they will mention her name and that she existed but they don't discuss her in any detail and they tend to emphasize other women instead who otherwise might not deserve the rank which is interesting and frustrating, but it's another element of those hidden voices which can really be concerning when you start to dig into it. So here's Ashait again on her coffin. Again, you can sort of see that, you know, there's multiple types of people in this scene and they are being depicted in different ways, which emphasizes some interesting things. I'll just include this picture quickly because it's one of my favorite little things that I noticed when I actually saw the coffin was that at one end, down near where her feet are, there are pictures of a shite's sandals. Just in case her burial goods were looted or lost, the artist made sure that she had some objects in her coffin that she could use in the afterlife. In this case, three pairs of sandals, which seems like a small collection of shoes, but, you know, say la vie. So now we move very quickly to the Valley of the Kings and the 18th dynasty. So we've jumped forward about uh, five to 600 years. I want to talk about another black individual named Maihir Peri. So Maihir Peri lived around 1450 BCE, and his tomb was discovered largely intact towards the end of the 19th century. And yet, for some reason, Maihir Peri has never really been published or discussed widely in the popular Egyptological literature. Maihir Peri lived at the royal court, and he was a companion of one of the pharaohs. We're not partic exactly sure which pharaoh, but he was a companion of a particular king. It was either Tutmos III, Amenhotep II, or Tutmos IV. There's a bit of debate on that. What's important, though, is how Maihir Peri represents himself. Maihir Peri was buried with, in a lavish coffin with burial goods, including a Book of the Dead. And in his Book of the Dead, he appears very clearly as a black individual with curly hair and uh, dark skin. And we see this in his mummy too, where he is very clearly a, you know, African individual. His mummy mask, very typical, but himself, not. And yet Maihir Peri also gets left out of conversations about Egyptianness, and he is treated as an other, even by Egyptologists who should theoretically know better, which is interesting, and it begs the question, who gets to be Egyptian? 
I'm going to skip that because I'm running out of time rapidly. So, ah, pardon me. So, to, so what I want to think about is, you know, what kind of stories are Egyptologists telling and who in particular gets to tell them? And how can podcasts improve this situation? So one thing that's important to me running the History of Egypt podcast is that I get to constantly update old episodes to reflect new scholarship. And that's something that I've, I'm currently working on and will be doing in the future as well, to constantly update with new information as we receive it. The second thing that I've been thinking about in particular, especially over the last few months, you know, where we've all been doing a lot of reflecting on these particular topics, is different ways that podcasts can collaborate with and give exposure to scholars who are outside of the traditional ivory tower institutions. You know, presenting the research of capable and experienced people who don't have professorships for various reasons and to not just emphasize the people at the top of the tier train, uh, top of the food chain. And another thing I've been wanting to think about with podcasts is opportunities for fundraising and different ways that we can contribute to individuals outside in the field, particularly who don't fit within uh, these traditional social and economic power structures. Because while Egypt, ancient Egypt itself has many hidden voices for a variety of reasons, some of those voices are hidden because Egyptologists allow them to be hidden and they can either passively or actively continue to hide them. And I don't think many of them, I don't think many of these voices are hidden intentionally, but I think they are hidden due to either fear of engagement with uncomfortable topics or unwillingness to go against the uh, traditional grains of scholarship and which stories get told. So as I was thinking about hidden voices, it, start, it has started to occur to me that ancient Egypt is hidden for many reasons and many aspects of ancient Egypt get hidden for many reasons. And as particularly this podcast moves forward or as people who are interested in ancient Egypt continue to explore this topic and this, this area, I think one of the things we really need to think about is the different ways that we are participating in those, those old patterns and the ways that we can uh, either undo them or solve them in the sense of, you know, whether it's an overlooked historical figure or challenging issues of representation and scholarship or simply supporting new researchers in different ways. One thing that I've learned in particular from doing this podcast is that we really have an opportunity to transcend those old limitations and create something that benefits everyone. And one of the things I'm hoping is that the History of Egypt podcast can contribute meaningfully to that process in future. That's the end of my presentation for now. I've cut out a little bit due to time, but thank you very much for listening. And I will allow my administrator, Andrew, to uh, take over now. Awesome. If you guys have questions, you always can put them in the ask a question tab at the bottom of your screen. You'll see it and you can uh, vote for the comments that you want to come up sooner. So the first question we have right away is uh, ancient Egypt is from Alexander and it says uh, ancient Egypt covers a vast timeline. Are there mm -hmm. any voices that are hidden in certain times that come to the fore in other times as centers of power and patterns uh, of life shift over time as patterns of life shift over time? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, broadly, I mean, broadly speaking, yes, obviously, after, over the timeline of, say, three, three and a half thousand years, you, you easily, automatically get different periods where different voices are more prominent. It's quite hard to pinpoint those, to answer that question in sort of modern language, if that makes sense, because we, we think of our society in, and the people within our society fundamentally different or in fundamentally different ways from the ancient Egyptians. The ancient Egyptians would not recognize our distinctions between socioeconomic classes and um, different types of people in the same way. Obviously, they had their own distinctions, which were quite important to them, but they, they would have trouble with that. I think if you, if you wanted to highlight a few sort of standout features, or standout changes in voices that really change is that 
say from about 1500 BC onwards, so let's say the, from after the 18th dynasty, going into the 19th and the 20th, as that period, the New Kingdom progresses, you absolutely start to see a much greater variety in terms of who has influence in the society, who has socioeconomic power in the society, and who is able to access the levers of power within the traditional government structure. So when the new kingdom begins under the 18th dynasty, the power players are very obviously the king, his family, and the favored officials whom he chooses as his agents or representatives, however you want to call them. 300 years later, the situation has changed and we see much more influence in the hands of military officials or high-ranking courtiers who are related to the king or related to the royal family in some respects, but not part of that core family. And we start to see variations in terms of who's who's wielding power and how they're, how they're influencing state decisions. And then you fast forward a couple hundred years more and you start to see groups like the high priests exercising a heck of a lot more influence than they used to. So broadly speaking, yes, those those changes do happen. It's a it's a challenging thing to pinpoint exactly who's participating, how they're participating, and why. That's something that obviously Egyptologists are continuously working on and updating their language. But broadly speaking, yes. Um, and yes, <laughs> essentially. Ah, um, this one is from Marianne. Uh, when creating a narrative about an ancient person based on archaeological evidence, I imagine a lot depends on creative extrapolation. How do you mm -hmm. keep modern assumptions and attitudes from creeping in too much? <clears throat> um, I don't. I'm a perfectionist, so I'm constantly crit criticizing my own work in terms of how I've depicted things and represented things. Um, a part of, part of it is intuition in the sense that I was raised to be an, a very empathetic person and that's, that's the way that I, I try to live my life is with a lot of empathy, even for people that I disagree with that I particularly like. So one thing that I, I try to do, or at least I'm consciously aware of when I'm making those extrapolations is how how believable is the extrapolation to a basic human experience in the sense of if i look at an object can i can i can i see a way that it would be reflected in basic human experiences you know family life uh raising children gathering food subsistence uh that kind of thing a lot of it is something that comes from experience and reading between the lines as the more and more I learn. So, you know, I'm much better at doing it now than I was even two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. But it's basically a constant a constant game of um, re-evaluating what I've written um, at different times, you know, write my script, come back to it a few days later, look at it and think, hey, okay, have I, was I, did I extrapolate too far in that particular direction? Things, um, a heck of a lot of editing, basically. Um, I sort of I did a did a rough calculation recently, which is that for every for every thirty minutes of the podcast, there's probably about twelve hours of research, writing, and editing that's gone into that. So it's just constantly hacking away at it and thinking about every sentence and word that I use. Interesting. Um, this one is from Rachel. Uh, which female pharaoh would you consider to be your favorite? Hi, Rachel. Um, that's a tough question, and I'll I'll try not to get academic on that. Um, I think Kenti Kaus the first is my favorite. Um, Kenti Kaus the first, for those who don't know her, appears at the end of the fourth dynasty. She is a descendant of people like Khufu. And she is 
she tur she turns up around uh, let's say 2500 BCE approximately as a major power player in the royal court and she's she could be the wife of Mankaure, the builder of the third Giza pyramid, or she could be his sister or his um, f a female relative in some respect. We're just not sure. Anyway, the reason I like her is that she she seems to usher in the next the next period of rulership. She puts her son on the throne, and she builds a strange monument, or she commissions a strange monument, I should say at Giza, which is kind of like a mastaba, kind of like a step pyramid, kind of neither. And you can still see it. It's still there. It's very visible and it's not it's not locked away or anything. You can go look at it. It's a very strange rock cut tomb that looks like a looks like a half step pyramid or a, like a mastaba, this flat top stone thing. And it's it's a little bit south of the Sphinx. And within that tomb, she depicted herself as a woman seated on a throne, wearing a, wearing a dress and holding the, a staff that is traditionally associated with women and a, a crown, like a vulture, so female female headdress. But then she has a little beard, like kind, kind of like me, I guess, this little little fake beard that she's wearing. It's this very, very un, unexpected little affectation that she uses, which indicates a heck of a lot of symbolic power and influence and we don't know much about her in terms of the actual role she might have played what you know was she a pharaoh or was she the power behind the throne kind of thing you know one of those like a one of those people who just moves the pieces around to suit her we're not sure but those kind of questions make her particularly fascinating so i'm going to choose kemti kaus um and even though she might not technically be a pharaoh or a king, she's still my favorite so far. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is from J.E. Young. Have, have, how have the more sensational documentaries on ancient Egypt, the ones we see on the Discovery Channel, etc., help reveal hidden voices or help to hide them? Hmm. God, do you have all day? Um, Hmm. All right. So one of the one of the good things that those documentaries tend to do and is that they they give much more voice to the modern Egyptian researchers. So that's the be that's the best thing about those documentaries is that they they really tend to put people like uh, Professor Salima Ikram at the forefront or uh, Dr Dr Tarek Taufik who's directing the Grand Egyptian Museum. They put they put Egyptians front and center much more and more than they used to, which is ten out of ten. As for how they obscure hidden voices, um, well, the first thing is that they those documentaries tend to focus on the grand and the glamorous and the exciting stories. You know, there's. 100 documentaries about the Great Pyramid, and there's, you know, 50, 100 documentaries about Akhenaten or Ramses II or the Battle of Kadesh, you know, anything that, anything that makes for good TV, that kind of stuff. So, and I understand why they're doing that. I'm not, I'm not criticizing the fact that they choose to do that. It's an obvious, there's an there's obvious logic to it. But the way that they obscure those hidden voices is simply by the fact that they continue to focus on the same topics over and over and over again and they never dive deeper into the richer nuanced histories of that time period interesting this question is from linda what linda. now what now lost site in egypt would you most like to have visited before it was destroyed hmm oh easy um the fortress of Buhen in what we call Lower Nubia or Wawat, it's it is now it's now sunk by the uh, Lake Nasser from the Aswan High Dam, and the fortress of Buhen was, as far as it, as far as we can tell, probably the largest Egyptian fortress in this region. It was built of mud brick, so it it was one of those monuments that it wasn't possible to save and to dismantle and to move when they were doing the recovery project. 
Is that still working? Yep, everything is still working. Oh, I've actually turned off the video. <laughs> For some reason, the thingy just crapped out. OK, there we go. Sorry. Um, yeah, so Buhin is a magnificent, huge fortress that was occupied and used for three to 400 years at least, possibly more. And it was also used by Egyptians and by the kingdom of Kerma or Kush, who took it over during a period of um, sort of pharaonic, uh, what's the word, contraction. Uh, during one of the intermediate periods, the Egyptian state lost control of Buhin. And people from Nubia, you know, Kush or Wawat moved into that region and took over, took over the fortress. So if we could go back to that fortress and excavate it down to bedrock, the amount that it could probably tell us about uh, cultural traditions, cultural intermingling, uh, urbanism, military life in that region would be absolutely wonderful. And unfortunately, the the, ex the exploration of that of that fortress was limited to about three to five years before the the um, as one dam was completed. But yeah, if we could, if I could have that site back, I would give a lot of money, all the money that I have to have Boo Hen back. Interesting. Uh, this one's from Matt. Which Hello. of the foreign rulers, Ottoman, Roman, etc., of Egypt do you think was the most important for Egyptian history? Saladin, easily. Um, Saladin of the, I guess you might call them the Saracens, you know, easily, easily the one who made Egypt in many respects, what it is today. So Saladin is partly responsible for Cairo being the capital when he built an enormous, or he commissioned an enormous fortress there. He led, he led Egypt or he governed Egypt at a time when Egypt was still a major political player in the region and was able to navigate, you know, the period of crusades essentially and his his influence or the influence of his government and his his people on the political history of egypt is in my mind the most significant since the pharaonic period that being said you know i'm sure if you asked me again in five years after i did more research i might have a different answer but i think for now i'd say saladin interesting um those are all the questions we have with the okay. last two minutes, with the last minute and a half we have, do you have any closing remarks or anything you want to just say uh, with the last minute and a half? Um, no, I mean, I'll just say thank you. Thank you very much, everyone who, who joined the conversation. Um, sorry that my thing got cut a little bit short, but, you know, I tend to ramble a little bit. So I had to rush through it a tiny bit there. Um, yeah, but this... Thank you very much for joining, and especially thank you to you, Andrew, for, for admining this and organizing it. Um, yeah, I'm th and I'm thinking. Well, I'm grateful for this. I'm grateful for the opportunity to present here because it's really given me a chance to sort of think through a lot of different things and to figure out ways that we can move forward. And I'm actually going to use. Some, I've still got plenty of notes here that I haven't discussed, so maybe I'll use them in in the ancient history panel that we're about to start. Uh, yeah, but thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And I hope to see you again next year. Or if not, I'll see you on the podcast. Exactly. Well, everyone, have fun at their next uh, presentations. Broadcast is being ended okay. right now.